Next up is scoped threads. And just before we look at the book, this uh, you can see there are all these uh, use statements here. And what that is, is um, this is all the, uh, the use statements you need to use any code in the book. Uh, I noticed this, uh, where is it? It's in the preface. And right here, uh, it says, um, the following prelude can be used to import everything necessary to compile any of the code examples in the book. So uh, I'll just be uh, bringing this in on top and then we won't need to be, uh, won't need to type any use statements. And then just, uh, just uh, kind of scroll a little bit and then uh, make it invisible. And so that's how we'll do it. So let's get to scope threads. Which is uh, interesting because it was supposed to be in Rust version zero. Um, didn't uh, didn't arrive until 1.63, Rust version one. I mean, uh, but the book gets into that, so uh, we'll look at that in a second. Okay, scope thread. So if we know for sure that a spawn thread will definitely not uh, outlive a certain scope, that thread could safely borrow things that do not live forever, such as local variables, as long as they outlive that scope. So it's just regular Rust borrowing rules. If something's alive and you can um, you can uh, borrow it, then uh, you, there you go. It doesn't ha doesn't need to be static. You don't need to move. Use the move keyword to do it. Uh, the Rust standard library provides the standard thread scope function to spawn such scoped threads. It allows us to spawn threads that cannot outlive the scope of the closure. So here's the closure there, and all the threads are definitely going to be uh, living inside there, and they. They can't go past it. Uh, of the closure that we pass that function, making it possible to safely borrow local variables and uh, how it works, best shown with an example. So let's type that example as yes, code. And let numbers, of course, just like one of my code samples, start with a vec of three items. And then we go thread, scope, and this makes a scope. So uh, we don't have threads yet, but we have this uh, this thing called a scope. And for some reason, Rust Analyzer freaks out at this point, unless you uh, reload the window. I, uh, I tried this, I was uh, doing a video just uh, five minutes ago, and I was curious what happened, so uh, I stopped it. And yeah, it's just Rust Analyzer. <clears throat> so anyway. Uh, so we'll call it uh, S. We don't have to call it S, but uh, we're going to because that's easy. So we will uh, S spawn. Do that again. Spawn another thread. And there we go. And inside, and this is missing a bracket. There we go. Okay, so we have spawned uh, two threads. And I think this is also missing a bracket. How come it's missing a bracket? Is it good now? Okay, so there we go. I'm going to format this cargo, cargo, font format. Make it look nicer. It looks the same. Okay, so anyway, we have this. Uh, this uh, thread, a scope thread, and so we can do stuff like this: length and uh, numbers dot len. So this is just uh, okay. Overwrite. So that is just uh, regular borrowing, and then for n in numbers, we are going to print out each of the numbers like this and then when we run that then it's just going to give us give us the length and the the numbers and so they're you know they're inside the scope they're running at the same time so it should be uh, you can see sometimes the uh, the v the order of the output is different so here Luckily, we got uh, two different outputs. One, two, three. Luckily, because it's uh, I wanted to show that one, two, three, and then length, and then the other time length three, one, two, three. So inside the scope, they're definitely you know real threads running uh, simultaneously. Uh, and but because it's a scope, 
scope and uh, if you do this then the program is going to hang around forever because it's waiting for the, uh, the scope to finish whereas in a, uh, a normal thread you c it just spins around on its own and uh, it's not going to stop the flow of uh, execution as you wait for it to finish so let's get back to this um, what does it say we call the thread scope function with the closure uh, directly executed and gets an argument s yep we did that uh, we use s to spawn threads they can borrow local variables yes and uh, yes automatically joined so that's why if you have a loop inside it hangs around forever because it's trying to join uh, this pattern guarantees that none of the threads can uh, outlive the scope uh, because of that does not have a static bound, which is nice. Um, all right, same point there. Uh, in the example above, both of them are concurrently accessing numbers, and that's fine because they're not modifying it, so that's just the regular Rust rules. However, if we were to change the first thread to modify numbers, then it uh, wouldn't allow us to spawn another thread that uses numbers. So that's just the regular borrowing rule. So what are we doing? Uh, scope. So we're going to push this time. So we're going to go numbers dot push, and we're going to push another number inside there. And then if we do uh, so right away, it is uh, oh can't declare it as mutable. First, we'll make it mutable. So we're trying to make it work. But then it says, there you go, cannot borrow numbers as, uh, you know, this the regular uh, error message you see when you try to do uh, a mutable and uh, an immutable borrow at the same time. And of course, a second mutable borrow is also not okay, so this will also not compile. So that's nice. Let's go back to the book. Uh, the exact error message depends on the version of the Rust compiler. Yeah, but it'll look like this. Okay. The leak uh, apocalypse. So this is a, a interesting historical note. So before Rust uh, 1.0, it, uh, it actually had scope threads. And uh, instead of using a uh, join handle, it had this join guard. Uh, I didn't know. Um, this was back in 2015. I didn't even know what Rust was back then. Most people didn't. And uh, so it seemed all right because the join guard would uh, would hang around and it would get dropped. But then uh, people noticed that you can actually you can leak uh, leak memory in Rust, which is actually it's safe. Um, leaking memory is just um, the memory it gets leaked, but it's not unsafely accessed. So uh, the leak functions uh, methods in Rust are actually safe. Uh, so what happened is uh, the conclusion was made that the design of a safe interface cannot rely on the assumption that objects will always be dropped at the end of their lifetime. Uh, for example, leaking an object, you might leak um, more objects. Like if you leak a VEC, then it will leak uh, the elements inside the VEC. Um, but uh, because of this conclusion, uh, they decided that uh, scoped was not safe. Uh, they got rid of it. And then... Um, uh, standard mem forget was upgraded from an unsafe function to a safe function. Yeah, forget is, uh, is something you use sometimes, like if you don't want Rust to drop something, and maybe you use like uh, you're interfacing with maybe like C code and you want it to access that memory, and so you don't you want Rust to just like forget about the memory. Um, and then so yeah, finally got added again. And the other interesting thing here is you can see you get a real feel for how how new Rust was at the time, because one point, if something like this was proposed now, I think people would notice it right away. Whereas uh, Rust 1.0, it was more like the, the Rust language project than the Rust language. Like probably nobody was uh, um, uh, like fluent in it, like, like as a mother tongue, so to speak. And so, um, yeah, right now uh, it, this would get uh, noticed right away. Probably back then, what well, you had people who were most mostly like C and C++ and OCaml and that was where, the, where their minds were and then Rust was like this new thing they were putting together and uh, just like not as many uh, people uh, testing it out before it, before it got released. So it's interesting how much the language has grown since then.